Merry Christmas. We're almost there. We're down to that last week. Everybody prepared? We know. I have some notes. So usually I find there's about three groups of people when it comes to this, okay? So let's get a little audience participation. I'm used to teaching uh, seniors at 8.20 in the morning. And I really look forward to after the break because 8.20 in the morning is like the earliest they've they haven't been up that early in weeks. And so I gotta kinda get them alive and awake a little bit. So um, how many of you, by show of hands, um, are done? Is there anybody in here, you're done shopping? We have a couple of you like that. Okay, quite a few, awesome, nice job everybody, well done. Uh, is there anybody in here, maybe you're down to the last two or three items, couple things? Okay, a few of you. And I have a really good friend, we've been friends for years and years and years, and he starts his Christmas shopping on December 24th. Do I have any of those in the house? We have a few of those here who are that way too. Okay. Um, there is a little stress at this time of year sometimes, yes? No? Maybe? Um, this can be fun, but it can be difficult to navigate um, gift giving, parties, family gatherings. Maybe we can't see everybody we want to because people live somewhere else. Or maybe we've lost someone this year and we don't get to see them. Uh, there can be pressure to give gifts. Have I given the right gift? Did I give a gift? Should I give a gift? How much of a gift? All of that can really start to add stress to our lives. Today I want to talk to you about something else, another gift, an extra gift, I've called it. And have you ever had this happen? Maybe you passed out all the presents and all of a sudden there's an extra gift under the tree? And if you're like me, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap myself out here. Um, sometimes my wife has done a lot more of the purchasing than I have, and so I'm like, hmm, I wonder what we got them, right? You know, so you're just as surprised as the person getting the gift. But maybe you just didn't see it or it got stuck behind the tree, and today we have one of those, so we have an extra gift. Now, what, what do we have inside our extra gift? Well, let, let's talk about that. So, Salvation is something that we focus on as Christians, and we think about what Jesus did for us at this time of year. Can you imagine being Jesus and being in heaven, and God says, hey, I need you to do something for me? He gave up heaven to come down for us. And not only did he give up all of that, he was killed and crucified for us, which we celebrated Easter, but I remember that at this time of year because he had to do all of that. How many of you would like to go back and, you know, live the last 30, 40, 50 years again? Uh, I don't know. I think I'd pass on it myself. But what I want to talk to you about is uh, these, these extra things that, that God has done for us. And then we, as I've continued to grow, and as Matt said, I've had to unlearn a lot. I don't know about you guys, but some of my church time beforehand, we had to kind of think differently about God and think differently about my position with God and what God's thinking about me. So we had to change many of those different types of things. And it's really easy to focus on salvation. So this, this is kind of like salvation, right? And salvation's amazing. But as you learn and as you grow, you understand there's, there's more inside of salvation, right? God has given us um, provision. He's provided healing. He's provided so many different things. So I want to talk to you about one extra gift inside salvation. Set this here. And hey, what do you know? It's another gift. I want to talk to you today about the fact that you are not condemned. Paul talks about this. We're going to go through some scriptures. But I think condemnation is a much bigger deal than we understand. Now, why is it? Maybe I'm alone, but I think it's a big challenge that we have to face in the church. Because I think sometimes the broader church doesn't handle this the right way. How, does they, how do they handle it? Have you ever been in a church service where they use condemnation as sin management tool? And maybe like Matt was talking about a few weeks ago, we have these 14 steps you need to do so that you can get on the right path with God. I remember before I'd heard the grace message, I was sitting down with a friend of mine and I'd sat down with Chris and shared this. And I said, I can't do more. I felt like I was on a treadmill and treadmills can be very valuable, but have you ever noticed you don't really get very far? And so I felt like I was on a Christian treadmill and I just couldn't do more. And I'll tell you what, I felt condemned a lot. So I want to talk to you today about this because there's condemnation in our world. How many times do you turn on the news, whatever news channel yours is, and that's what we hear. This other side's trying to destroy us all and we're all going to heck in a handbasket. And there are a lot of difficulties in the world. I can't, I mean, I can't say there's not, right? I mean, the Middle East and in Europe and in here, and there's problems everywhere. 
So people are screaming and they're hollering at each other. So I want to talk about what is condemnation and, and how is this gift important to you today? So we're going to look at what it is, how it works, why it matters, and how it reflect, reflects on our relationships. Because it affects us, our, it affects our relationship with God, and it affects our relationship with other people. So uh, being a teacher, uh, one of the things we have to do first is we have to define the word. So let's take a look at condemn. So if we look it up in the dictionary, this is the Cambridge Dictionary, it says that to condemn means to criticize something or someone strongly, usually for moral reasons, okay? So we have all been criticized from one time to another. There may not be a slide. Um, another way I like to look at words and understand it is to look at synonyms. You guys all remember synonyms, right, from English class back when we were younger? And synonyms of this are censure, criticism, reprimand, rebuke. These are very strong words that we've all probably been um, subject to at one point or another. Or, God forbid, maybe we've used them. Maybe we've criticized someone. Maybe we have been that, that voice of condemnation. We see it very much in a legal sense. So this is condemnation. I imagine most of you knew what it was, but I like to set the, the, lay, it, lay it flat. Let's talk about what we're doing, make sure everybody knows. Condemnation, how does it affect our relationship with God? Condemnation brings stress, and condemnation brings fear. It weighs us down. It's like we're walking with an extra 50 or 100 pounds on our back. If we sit and remember and dwell on all of our sins, we begin to mentally separate ourselves from God. We do this. God does not. Some of the teaching in my past has been, well, you've done this, so God's now mad at you. God's now had it with you and has been upset. No, I don't think so. This can cause us to fear that we don't overcome these challenges because we've separated from God, because we think God's mad at us, we think he's up there condemning us. Now we're concerned. Now we're fearful that things aren't going to go the way we wanted to. So let's take a look back and see if we can gain some insight from where this has started. Where did condemnation start and fear and stress? It started in the Garden of Eden. So if we remember, God created the earth and he created man and he created woman, and then the devil showed up, right? And, and what did he say? He said, well, the, the, God said not to eat of this tree, but you will surely not die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. This is in Genesis 3. So what happened? We all know the story. Adam, Eve ate, Adam ate, they ate the apple, sin entered the world, the curse was in the world. Now, this is where stress enters. How do we know this? If we look at Genesis 3.19, we see that in the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. That sweat speaks of the stress and the effort it now takes to eat. I remember the curse every time I pick weeds. Anybody here love picking weeds in Florida? Right? And it feels like you can go out and pick like a million weeds today, and tomorrow morning you'll go out and there's new ones, and that is an opportunity. So every time I pick a weed, I think, hey, thanks, Adam, I really appreciate that. Not that I'd have done any better, but, you know, it makes me feel a little bit better. So if we go deeper, we find fear. So remember, they sinned, and what does Adam do? They hide. And God says, why are you hiding? And he says, what? Because I heard your voice and I was afraid. So now we see that break in that relationship, and now we see condemnation, we see fear. Why was he afraid? Well, because he, he partook of the knowledge of good and evil. Now keep in mind, it's the knowledge of good and evil, and he believed that he had to do this in order for him to be like God. It wasn't the tree of evil, it wasn't even the tree of sin. It's the tree of knowledge. So now we know. And this is where the law is going to come in and we're going to see what the law does in our life. Struggle, poverty, lack, and disease all pours in here. The Bible tells us in Romans 3 that by the law we see the knowledge of sin. Um, when we're condemned and when we're operating in fear, we know we've fallen short. And our natural reaction is to pull back and pull away from God. This can affect our health. Did you, did you know this? Condemnation causes stress, 
And stress is a nasty, nasty thing. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I used WebMD, which I realize sometimes if you go on WebMD, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you're like, I think I have half those symptoms, and you probably don't. But anyway, I, I did pull this from here, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but stress seems to worsen or increase the risk of conditions like obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, depression, gastrointestinal problems, and asthma. That sounds like a good portion of the country, doesn't it? Somebody's dealing with one of these? We're under stress, and we as Christians should not be under stress. So let's talk about where this comes from. Well, this comes from two different places. Number one, the enemy condemns us. Now, I'm not saying Satan's sitting on your ear, but if you're my age or older, you probably remember the cartoons. In the cartoons, you got the little devil sitting on one side and the little angel sitting on the other. And how many times have you heard the enemy say, you know, you're really probably not good enough. You didn't do these 14 things today. I don't know how you can call yourself a Christian because you didn't do this and this and this. That's the voice of condemnation. That's not what God came to do. That's not why he sent Jesus. He sent them to save us. And we'll take a look at this as we keep going. Um, I think of this as the courtroom. Did anybody in here grow up watching Perry Mason or Perry Mason reruns? <laughs> yes, few of you. Okay, I'll get to another more uh, recent top uh, example in a minute. But uh, I, I watched it for two or three reasons. One, it was on. And when I grew up, we had like four channels. And so your, your options were limited. Um, number two, the, the actor's name was Raymond Burr, and I knew no other Raymonds, so I thought that was pretty awesome, right? I'm, I'm kind of there. And then I'll admit, the other reason I watched it, and I might be wrong about the year, but he had a 59 Cadillac Eldorado that was probably almost as long as this stage, and that was just an awesome car. Really wanted one. Now they're probably really hard to find. But what the point is, is remember, uh, his client would be accused, and they'd bring in Lieutenant Trag, and I don't remember the DA, but they would accuse his his uh, um, patient, not patient, his um, customer, his, the person he's going to, yeah, that's it, uh, the person he's going to defend. And then it looks like it's, it's all over, but then Perry Mason comes in and he sends out his people, and of course, in the end of the story, Perry Mason gets off. To use a more modern day one, anybody Law & Order fans? <laughs> Sam Waterston, if Sam Waterston is your prosecutor, you might as well just go put yourself in jail now, right? Because <laughs> he shows up you are done, it is all over, it's curtains. But think about this courtroom, that's what Satan's there to do. The heavenly courtroom, as I see it, is God is the judge, and we have Satan, who is there to accuse us, and we bring in the Holy Spirit, and we'll talk about his work here in a few minutes. So why do we feel, why do we feel condemned? Well, as I said before, many churches I went to use condemnation as a sin management tool. But this isn't right. We're not under the law. <clears throat> Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So every mouth can be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sights by the work of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So the law is sent to remind you that you're not good enough on your own. And we're not, right? I mean, you guys have read the law. I think there's 613 laws. I can't even name them all, let alone keep them all. I got, I've got no shot. Now, Galatians 3, and I don't have this up there. I was going to summarize in, in 19 through 21. It says, if the law could impart life, then the law would make us righteous. But instead, we're made righteous through Christ. So once we accept Christ... We are righteous, and we're in right standing with God. Now, we know that the law brings the knowledge of sin, but what happens when you have it? Well, you know you've missed the mark, and you're condemned. The law condemns. Jesus is the answer. The law is a mirror. How many people looked in the mirror today? Yes? Okay. Were you looking to see how amazing you look, or were you looking to see the flaws? Were you looking to see if a hair was out of place? In my case, it was really easy. Uh, it took forever to dry my hair, but you know, I got through it. Um, right? We're looking for flaws. This is what the law does. We hold up the law as a measuring stick, as a mirror, and realize we're short. We don't have it. And what happens to you? I don't know what happens to you, but I know what happens to me. When I know I'm not going to make it, I just give up. I think of that race. As you can tell, I'm not built for um, long-distance running, as you might not be shocked by. Um, 
But if all of a sudden you know you have no shot, and it seemed like in, in gym class when I was in high school, I'd get right next to the guy who was the fastest. And so it's like, why am I here? Why am I trying? I've got no shot. And I think that's what the law does for us, is we see that, we know we can't do it, and so we just give up. And I don't think that's where we should be. But now that we're saved, now that we're in Christ, we need to think about it a little differently. So Romans 6.14 tells us, for sin will no longer be a master over you, since you're not under the law as slaves, but under unmerited grace as recipients of God's favor and mercy. Wait, sin's no longer a master over us? Hmm. That's a topic for another day, but there's something there that's worth looking at. So we're righteous through Jesus, and sin has no hold on us. We're not under the law, so no charge can be brought against us that has any merit, because the law does not apply to us. The law doesn't apply to us. Amen. Isn't that exciting? The law does not apply to us. That is good news. Praise, thank you. Yeah, praise God. I mean, that's awesome. So then, why do we feel condemned still? We still carry this. Am I the only one? Is this just me talking to me? Do we feel condemnation at times? I think we do, and I think it slows us down, and I think it's painful. Well, we're not condemned. Why did Jesus come to earth? If I went out in the crowd with a microphone and I said, tell me John 3.16, I would bet virtually every single one of you would know John 3.16. But do you know John 3.17 and 18? Let's go. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him should be saved. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not is stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. We should be excited. As Christians, we should be out there spreading joy simply because we're not condemned. And if you know someone who's not saved, they are condemned. And you know how it feels to walk in condemnation. Terrible, right? It doesn't feel good. Jesus did not come to point out how bad we are. He came to tell us that because of him, we're righteous. And I think that's an amazing thing to keep in mind every single day as we navigate our world. One of the most well-known passages regarding condemnation, and I would imagine most of us could quote this too, is in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Right? You probably can do it. If you grew up where I grew up, we had a little song. I'm not going to sing that to spare you, but some of you have smiles, right? Do we know it? There is there for now. No condemnation. You remember this song? No? Just me? Oh, well, that's probably as far as we need to go. But anyway, um, uh, I want to keep you for a little bit longer. I don't want to drive you out just yet. But there is therefore now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you'll see again that legal courtroom theme is there as we, as we examine the Greek. There's no condemnation. There's no guilt or no punishment for those in Christ Jesus who believe in him as their personal Lord and Savior. For the law of the Spirit is life. In Christ Jesus, the law of our new being has set you free from the law of sin and death. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Now, we remember this is the Apostle Paul writing this to the church in Rome. How do you think the Romans uh, treated the Christians? Real well, yeah, exactly. I know some of us aren't always happy with our government, and we're not always happy with the things going on in our world, but if any Christian at any time had a reason to complain, I think the Roman church in the first century probably was there. Um, but they understood the human condition. So we quote this, we think of this, and then I don't know about you, but for most of my Christian life, maybe until really recently, I'd go, great, I'm not condemned, and I'd set it aside. And as I was preparing for this message, God said, no, well, let's go back and look at that. Because, so Paul says this, it sounds awesome. As we were reminded this morning during praise and worship, the end of chapter 8 there is, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing. That's awesome. But how does Paul get us there? So I don't have these on, on, on there, but let's go back to Romans 7, just the few verses before he tells us, therefore. So I find it to be the law of my inner self that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully delight in the law of God 
in my inner self with my new nature. But I see a different law and rule of action in the members of my body, in its appetites and desires, waging war against the law of my mind and subduing me and making me a prisoner of the law of sin within my members. So Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, tells us a couple of things in these verses. Number one, his flesh is about as good as our flesh is. Right? We're saved, but sometimes our flesh gets in the way. This body has desires and things it wants to do or not, doesn't want to do that can sometimes cause us problems. So he's, he's telling us, hey, I have problems too. And then in verse 24, he says, wretched and miserable man that I am. Who will rescue me and set me free from this body of death, this corrupt moral existence? Thanks be to God for my deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he's still, he's still, he's still working through some challenges. So that on one hand, I myself and my mind and I serve the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, my human nature, my worldliness, my capacity, he sees this dichotomy in himself and he tells us about it to make us feel better. I, I really like it when pastors are vulnerable because sometimes when we see a pastor on stage, we think they have it all put together um, and they don't. They're humans just like us. They're struggling just like us. And I want you to know every time I'm getting up, I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody because I need to hear this too. Um, one of the pastors that I sat under for a number of years was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. And to say that he had the need for speed was uh, an understatement. Uh, he um, had done well in business, and so he bought himself a Porsche Cayenne, if you guys know what those are. And apparently, uh, this was in Minnesota, the state troopers knew who he was too, because at one point he had lost his license, he'd gotten a few too many speeding tickets. Now, why do I tell this story? Because it's vulnerable, and that's what I love about Paul here. He's like, look, I don't have it all together. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not any better than you are. I still have this inside of me. I know God. I want to serve God, but yet I still deal with this wretched person that I am on the inside, my sinful capacity, and I still serve the law of sin. That's the end of Romans 7. Romans 8 is what we just shared. Therefore, even though this is the problem, I'm still not condemned. So sometimes I think, well, yeah, 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 we're not condemned. But think about Paul had the same problems we did. Maybe more, like I said. I mean, if you go back and look at the, the life of Paul, it was not exactly smooth sailing, right? Shipwrecked, thrown in prison, um, under house arrest. I mean, it was, not, it was not a cheery time for the Apostle Paul. So how do we embrace this gift, right? So we understand that condemnation exists. We understand the weight of condemnation. And we've seen now that we're not condemned. Now, this is not self-improvement. This is not, thou shalt do these 14 things to make sure that you attain this. This gift is already yours. So what I, want, what I want to do here is help you understand that gift and remember, especially as we go through this time of year, when you may not be feeling as 100% great as you'd like to be, what can you do about it? The first thing I really would think you should do is to stop focusing on your sins. The problem with using condemnation as sin management, among others, is that sin stays right in front of you all the time. Now, am I saying you should ignore your challenges? No. But let me give you an example. The law tells us about our sin, and the more we focus on it, the more we get sucked in and we just sit there and think about it. Can you stop thinking about something that you see in front of it or dwell on it? I don't think you can, so let me give you an example. So I have a picture here of a Christmas dinner. Is anybody excited about Christmas dinner? I like presents. I like giving presents. I really like Christmas dinner. Anybody else? Okay, good. We have a few out there. Now, are you a ham or a turkey or a roast beef kind of family? All of them? All of the above? I'm in? I'll be over at three. I like meat. Now, if you don't like meat, that's great. There's a lot of other things. But can you smell the ham yet as it's wafting through the house? Is that your favorite part? Or are you more of a sides person? Do you like the, potato, the mashed potatoes? Um, I, I was blessed to marry into a family. My wife's an amazing cook. My mother-in-law's an amazing cook. And if you don't know my father-in-law, when he, when he hits the smoker and he brings all that meat together, smoked meat is just like, it maybe is heaven, but we're pretty close to heaven at that point, in my viewpoint, okay? Can you taste it? Have you ever had smoked turkey? And, and it starts to hit the back of your tongue and those taste buds. Is your mouth watering yet? 
Okay, now while I talk about this and I leave this picture up here, I want you to stop thinking about Christmas dinner. Stop thinking about how good it is, how, how that, that warm pie tastes as you cut through the pie and it slides into your mouth. Can you stop thinking about it? No, you can't. And so now, on the good part, you're excited about Christmas dinner. And now your stomach's churning and going, I want to eat now. You're welcome, by the way. That's, you know, one of those little gifts early. But the point is, is if we sit and continue this, we can't get past this mistake. It's difficult to keep doing this. Now, is, is no condemnation and grace a license to sin? Absolutely not. Paul talked about this, right? Let's go back to Romans 6, verse 15. What are we to conclude? That we shall sin because we're not under the law, but under God's grace? No, certainly not. Do you not know when you continually offer yourselves to someone to do their will, you're slaves to the one you obey? You're either a slave of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul's telling us that we are saved we are under grace. But if you continue to sin, which doesn't have power on you, over you anymore, and like I said, that's a conversation for another day, but it's not good, right? Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll require more than you want to give, and it's painful. But if we do it and we're trying to get past something, we're not condemned. Let me be clear. I am not saying we shouldn't examine the problems we have. We might need some help to get past them. Talk to a pastor, a friend, a counselor. That's perfectly fine. But if we constantly focus on our sins, we're going to have trouble. Our sins are forgotten by God. He doesn't hold them against us. In Hebrews 10, it tells us their sins and lawless acts, they remember no more. I think that's great. I remember my sins more than God does. Did you ever think about that? So if God forgets our sins, maybe we should follow his example? Maybe? I, I, and I'm, I'm guilty, right? I, I do it too. So, but I think there's something here. Once we're saved, sin's not held to our account. There are earthly consequences, but we're not sinners. We are saints who make mistakes, and as the Holy Spirit leads us, we deal with our actions, and we make necessary changes. This change of position, I think, adjusts our entire outlook. Not just on our relationship with God, but our relationship with everyone else. I'll keep going. Romans 4 I encourage you to read the entire chapter. I spent a lot of time in Romans here. Paul really hits this hard in Romans. But Matt talked about this last week. Um, Romans 4, 7. Blessed, happy, and favored are those whose lawless acts have been forgiven and whose deeds have been covered and completely buried. Blessed and happy and favored is the man who this, whose sin the Lord will take not into his account and charge against him. Now remember, David's writing this. And David had to go have sacrifices every year to cover his sins. He, I think he's looking forward, maybe being prophetic here, saying, look, there's a time coming when it's gone, past, present, and future, forever, one sacrifice for all time. How awesome is that? How amazing is that? I can't get past it. Remember that your sins are tossed as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I teach history, I teach geography, and all of that stuff, and I know this is really basic, but he didn't say north to south. Because eventually, if you keep going north, you go south and vice versa. But east to west, you can go east for the rest of your life and never see it again. So that's where God is putting our sins. Remember, Paul also told us in Philippians, what? In Philippians 3, forgetting those things that are behind me and pushing forward and stretching ahead to the high call of Christ. So, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to stop dwelling on everything you've done wrong. The second thing I want you to do is rely on the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm here maybe to change your theology a little bit, or at least the theology I was taught growing up. Growing up, I was taught that the Holy Spirit is there to convict you, the Christian, of your sins. Has anybody else heard this, or am I the only one? Okay, we have four or five of us, so good. I'm not alone. Well, let's look at John 16. But truly I tell you, it is good that I am going away. And unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So this is the end of the, chapter, the, end of the book of John. Jesus has died and been resurrected, and he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he's telling them, I'm sending someone for you. And when he does that, he introduces the concept of the Holy Spirit. But he also tells us what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. When he comes, he will prove to the world 
to be wrong, to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no more. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, wait a minute. Are we the world? What's that say? It says he's here to condemn the world and convict the world because they need him. And that's what he says in the next one. He's going to point out that, you know, Jesus is no longer with us. He's, he's gone on to heaven. And you need him to be righteous. And then wait a minute. Satan uses his exact position against us. Because what does the end of that verse say? And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Satan knows he's condemned, so he's going to turn that on you. Don't let him turn it on you. Hebrews 10, if the Holy Spirit was here to convict us of our sins, then Hebrews 10 has some issues because Hebrews 10 says that the Holy Spirit testifies to us that our sins and lawless deeds he doesn't remember anymore. Amen. That's a gift. That, that's fantastic. He can convict us. How can he convict us of what he's forgotten? So let's take a look at the Greek, okay? I am not a Greek scholar, and my Greek pronunciation is probably about as good as my Chinese, which is non-existent, but I'll do my best. What I did find out in my research is the word parakletos is used here in the Greek. Now, for Holy Spirit, it's only used five times in the, the, the entire New Testament. There's another word that's used most of the time. There we go. That was it. What does it mean? It means one called to help. A helper, a comforter, a protector, a defender. Wait, a legal advocate? So let's go back to the courtroom drama. We're going to pull out Perry Mason for a minute, but the Holy Spirit's our Perry Mason. Right? He comes in. Imagine this scenario in your head. You're standing there. You're accused. The devil said, you're accused. God looks at the Holy Spirit and says, well, what's your defense? Jesus. He's there to remind you that you're saved, that the price has been paid. Yes, you don't measure up to the law, but guess what? You don't have to, because Jesus came to save us. Now we can stand uncondemned, even though we should be guilty. We should have the sin put to our account, but we don't have to. This is why David said what he did. What a blessing it is that your sins are not accounted to you, and it's forever. You don't have to do this every single year. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Remember what the Bible has told us. So we want to rely on the Holy Spirit. But the last thing I want to tell you to do is remember God's word. Right? This isn't a, you have to do this. But sometimes when things are going difficult and it's not going the way you want, back off. Just, just back away. I, know, I don't know about you, but when I get into arguments sometimes, I never argue with my wife, but on occasion, if it were to happen, there are times when you just need to back away. My youngest son, I love him dearly. I don't know why God gave me a type A son last, but he is type A, and what I have had to give him for advice multiple times is, dude, just walk away. Don't let that anger get to you. So when you're feeling condemned, walk away and pull out your Bible. Why? because then you'll remember what God's done for you. Write some of these verses down. Go back and read Romans 7 and 8. Go back and read Hebrews 10 and remember what God tells us. Write these down. Say them out loud. The benefit of saying them out loud is this. You can't say something out loud and think of something else. So if you're focused on who you are in Christ, you can't think about the voices of condemnation coming against you. Okay, as I wrap up, I want to look at two things. One, how did Jesus handle condemnation? And how does this affect our relationships with others? John 8 is probably the most popular or most well-known scripture about what Jesus did with condemnation. And this is the woman caught in adultery. Now, as I teach history, well, the way I really like to do it is I like to pull stories from history and I like to put myself and my students in that room or in that situation so we can kind of experience it just a little bit. So that's how I'm going to treat John 8 today. Now, the day before, Jesus had been up on the Mount of Olives teaching. The Bible tells us the next morning he comes to the temple. What does that look like? Well, the temple's a massive stone structure. He's probably in the outer court, 
The Bible doesn't tell us this, but I'll assume. And it's, it's stone. It's hard. It's dusty. It might be chilly. It might be around 50 degrees, or at least Florida chilly. If you're online and you're up north, 50 is not chilly, I understand. But it's cold, and he's there to teach. So I imagine there's a group there. I'm guessing when Jesus taught, he had a large group. Now, as we know from the story, the Pharisees were there. The Pharisees were the keeper of the law. They knew the law better than anyone else. And they were probably the, most, the largest group of self-righteous people in history. Right? Because they knew to keep the law that they would be considered righteous and then holy. They wanted to catch Jesus. Because they knew that if he was right, they were wrong. If he was right, they were wrong. So, what do they do? They find this woman in adultery, and they bring her in. Now, according to Jewish law, she should be stoned. And, depending on the, the situation, which we're not going to get into today because we're getting into nuance of Jewish law, and we don't want to get you that excited today. Um, the guy should have been there, but the guy wasn't. Now, we look at this Bible verse and we think, okay, they threw her in there. But stop and think for a minute what life is like for her. She was caught in the act of adultery. They yank her out of that situation. Do you think they just picked her up nicely and helped her along? No. She's crying. She's horrified. She knows what she deserves. She knows exactly what should happen to her. She should be stoned to death. I don't know if you've thought about stoning, but these aren't little pebbles that they pick up. They pick up rocks like this, and they throw them with all their might to crush her to death. And so she's probably seen a stoning. So she's seeing in her mind, is the way I look at it, exactly what she's up for. And so they throw her to Jesus and they say in a loud voice, because he's got a crowd there and they want to attract more people because they believe they finally got him. They're finally going to catch him and they're going to end his ministry. And so they say, um, I lost my notes. The law says Moses commanded us to stone such woman to death, but what do you say? And if he stones her, that's certainly not walking in love. But if he says, don't stone her, well, now he's breaking the law and we can arrest him. So I think hush falls over the entire crowd as they go, huh, I wonder what he is going to say. And so what does Jesus do? The same thing he does every time they try to trap him. He gets out of it. And so he stoops down and he starts drawing in the dirt. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was drawing. I think the way my brain works he was drawing the names of all the Pharisees' girlfriends. <laughs> That's what I think. It's not in the Bible, it's just my opinion. He stands back up and he says to them, whichever of you is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. So now you think it's quiet, I'm guessing you can hear a pin drop in that, that part of the temple. And what I find interesting is that it says, from oldest to youngest, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. Now, we don't know this, but I think the reason the oldest went away first is because they knew. I think some of them knew, right? We, we know the story of Nicodemus, but I think some of them knew that he was the real deal. And they knew they couldn't, they couldn't attain that standard. And so they walk away. And then Jesus looks at her, and I think he's wiping her tears away. And he says, woman, where are your accusers? Who's left to condemn you? And she says, they're gone. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. I have to think her life has changed at that point, clearly forever. And it's an example. I think there's several things that we can learn from this. Number one, when we're going through condemnation, look at Jesus. Pull out the word. Jesus is the word. Pull out the word and remember what it is he's done for us. Number two, um, don't condemn others, right? Uh, we, we get on other people's case, but the, but the big thing here to me is once we understand we're not condemned and we don't use condemnation as sin management, we now have the power to walk away from it. We now have the power to understand, look, it no longer has this hold on me. And I think that's powerful. Now, how does this apply to other people? Remember that we all fall short. But if we're in Christ, 
we or the other Christians we work with are not condemned. Is anybody going to run into someone maybe this week that they're not thrilled about running into? Is there a family member at coming to Christmas dinner or a party that maybe is just hard to love and is difficult to deal with? Am I the only one or do we all have one in our family maybe? Circle of friends, coworker. Well, what I want you to remember when you see them is if they're saved, they're not condemned either, but they may not know it. And if they're not saved, think of the condemnation they're under. They're under brutal attack day in and day out. Having a deeper understanding of no condemnation releases us from the fear that God will not love or bless us. It helps us back away from the mentality that we have to work for our position in Christ. It sets us free. If we understand that we're righteous but hold on to condemnation, we still pull away from God. We can use this understanding to walk in love and compassion with those around us and stop condemning others. Sometimes it can still be hard. Last week, Matt talked about keeping score, and he talked about the um, parable of the prodigal. And a lot of times, messages are spent focusing on the prodigal son and, and how he went away from his father and he came back in the party. I don't know about you, but I identify with the older son who was upset because, hey, I've been doing it right and I didn't get a party. Are you a scorekeeper? At this time of year, it's easy to be a scorekeeper, right? We like to look at someone else and say, well, I'm better than you because I do this, or I'm better than you because I don't do that. But we've all fallen short. We have to remember that this can strain our relationships and put enormous pressure on us to fix the world because it's not fair. We can't fix this world. That's not our job. Our job is to proclaim the love of Christ. Our job is to be a Christian and let other people know that we love them and God loves them. That's how our world gets fixed. That's the message I think we should share. The other thing we have to remember is, some, does it ever make you mad that someone doesn't get what they deserve? Right? You see someone who's out there doing things you don't like, and you're like, man, I wish they would get theirs. Okay, I'm the only one in here, but that's okay. <laughs> Keep in mind, what's really hard is, thank God I don't get what I deserve either. Because if I got what I deserved, I would be out of luck like the rest of us. This is not what Jesus showed us. He didn't use condemnation as sin management. He blew condemnation out of the water. He threw it away and showed us it was not to be used. He said, you're not condemned. Take that knowledge and leave your sin behind. So as we navigate this year, as we navigate the end, remember this extra gift. Remember that you are not condemned. Take that with you as you go, as you feel stress. Remember, Jesus doesn't condemn you, so don't condemn yourself. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your son and the amazing gift that we are not condemned. Help us to understand this more and apply this to our lives and the lives of those who are around us. Guide us and direct us as we go through this time. I ask for, for uh, relaxation for everyone here. Help them to navigate this time well. And above all, help us to remember why we celebrate this season. In Jesus' name, amen.